morning, Irish Springs family. I wanted to remind you that next week is the 42nd annual March for Life. I want to invite you to join me, dozens of our church members, and thousands of our Kansans as we go to our state capitol and peacefully make sure that our government and culture know that we stand for life. All the details are in the bulletin this morning. Hope you'll plan to join us next week. You'll stand up with us as we begin worshiping this morning. The dark tried to hide you and steal you away. Death tried to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you, he tried but he lost. You cannot be stopped. When we cried for freedom, you tore down the wall.
that song um, and you know being up front here I get to you know to see the band um, just worshiping as they lead us um, but this morning I kind of took a moment to look around the room um, it's just really awesome to watch a room full of people just worshiping um, in different ways eyes closed eyes open singing out um, praying raising their hands uh, it just makes my heart really happy um, and just love uh, just the atmosphere of worship that this team creates um, on Sunday mornings uh, through their rehearsal and their practice and their hard work, but also through their prayers that they soak this in. So um, thank you guys so much for leading us every morning. Um, that's right. Um, thank you guys so much. So it's awesome. Um, well, welcome to Geyer Springs. Welcome to Modern Worship in the venue. My name is Daniel Champagne, and I have the honor of serving on staff here at Geyer Springs. When you walked in this morning, you should have received a bulletin, um, and in that is a lot of information. And we got a lot of really cool things going on. You'll see at least three announcements in here about mission trips, and that's really awesome. Um, I love when we have uh, so many announcements to make about uh, information meetings and finding out what's going on, and we want you and your family and yourself uh, to just uh, be on mission, and whether that means here in town um, or going to a different state or a different country, uh, we want to always be on mission and ready to share the gospel um, and so you can look in there for some information about upcoming trips. And then you have an insert in your bulletin. And this, uh, this Sunday is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And we have some partners in the main lobby. And they are partners with us um, in uh, preserving life. And that is done through so many different um, venues. And so we'll have a special guest with us in a little bit um, that will kind of talk about that. Uh, kind of during our prayer time, and so you'll hear about one of those ways, but in that insert is different ways um, that those partners are helping to preserve life, and you can be involved with those as well. So you can be on mission here in central Arkansas, um, doing what God wants you to do, and helping share the love of Jesus with those who need it. And so uh, pay attention to that. Um, also in that bulletin is a connection card, and we have made it really easy for you to fill out that card. You can fill it out um, in your bulletin, you can fill it out on our website and on our app. And so there's all kinds of ways for you to fill that out. And more than just your information, we want to know how we uh, can serve you, how we can pray for you. And we want to know any decisions you may have made today as we go through the service, as Pastor Dave shares the word. Um, if you've made a commitment, we want to know about that. And so you can write that in that card. And as we leave today, there'll be our connection team at the doors. And they'll collect those cards. And they'll collect any tithes or offerings that anyone has. And so that's where you can give. That's where you can put down your card. But if you are a first-time guest or you've been coming to Geyer Springs for a couple weeks, maybe a couple months, no judgment here. Um, if you have decided that today you want to learn more, you want to talk to someone, find out how you can be involved at Geyer Springs, if you want to just text the word guest to that number, I'll get that text message, and after service, I'll be hanging out right over here next to the stage, and I'd love to meet you, get to know you, answer, answer any questions you have, um, and I will give you a Chick-fil-A gift card for coming to talk to me, okay? Sometimes I have, uh, yes, there we go. Somebody liked my joke. So I usually don't have to bribe people to come talk to me, but I will bribe you today. So uh, I'll give you Chick-fil-A gift card. Just come shake my hand. I just want to get to know you. And if you've been coming for a while and you've decided, I want to find out even more. I possibly want to get involved at Geyer Springs. I want to learn about membership. Tonight we're having our Discover class. 
and it's a couple hours. We feed you, we watch your kiddos, and we tell you about Geyer Springs, our vision, our mission, where we're going. You'll hear from multiple pastors. You'll get to meet some of our pastors. It's just a great way for you to find out if Geyer Springs is the place that you want to make your home. And so that's this evening. The information is in your bulletin. You can email Kim Bailey real quick. You can even write it on your connection card. I want to attend Discover and we'll sign you up and we'll have dinner ready for you this evening. And so it'll be a really great time. And so um, that's all the announcements I have this morning. But Pastor Dave is here this morning and he wants to give you guys a quick announcement. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning. Good to see you guys here in worship this morning. I don't get to see you every week. It's always fun to come in and, uh, and see and get to experience a part of worship with you. I actually have a specific task I was sent here for this morning. That's a security update. And they actually gave me a script because they don't like when I go off script and um, kind of mess things up. So uh, first of all, let me say you may have noticed last week when you were arriving, uh, we had a visit from the Three Stooges last week. They were out here on the uh, lower part of our property in the woods. Three men who decided to hunt, uh, had a shotgun. They were on private property, it was not hunting season, and they were all convicted felons. So they're not going to be visiting with us again. Um, I mentioned that to say, and this is not part of our security update, but just to let you know, several have asked about hunting here because there's a lot of deer back in the woods and hunting at Raymar. You can't do that, okay? It's in the city limits, and our insurance doesn't allow that. Now, uh, two weeks ago, there was an, uh, an active shooter in a White Settlement, Texas. I'm sure most of you are aware of that. Um, the good thing about what happened was they had trained security. In six seconds, the event was over. Two men did lose their lives, but it could have been much, much worse. Uh, I need you to know that we have a large, uh, very active security team here at Geyer Springs. We're a much bigger church. We have uh, all of our areas covered. We're not going to tell you who the team is. Um, we're not going to tell you where they're located. Just know that we have a very large team. They're on duty every Sunday. Um, there are uh, security folks in each of our worship menus. There are security folks in the hallways, security folks around the perimeter. Um, these guys are very well trained. Uh, many of them are either law enforcement or military background. So they know what they're doing, they know how to handle situations. In addition, and you'll see these, we also have off-duty law enforcement officers every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday, who are there to kind of help enhance what we do, um, their eyes for us, and they're ready to respond if that's necessary. So we want you to feel very secure, especially when you're in here in worship, when you're in your Bible study. We want you to feel very secure that you are well covered and well protected. In addition to our security team, our greeter team, um, who are at the outside doors and on the parking lot, have been trained in what to watch for. And so they enhance the security we do by providing an extra buffer uh, or perimeter. It's very unlikely that someone that we don't know wearing a trench coat or carrying a duffel bag or in a disguise is ever going to get inside our building. Uh, so I want you to feel good about that. Now, here's what I need to say to you. Two things. Um, in the unlikely event, there was an active shooter in our building. And I say unlikely because we have safeguards at the doors and on the parking lot. It's unlikely they would get in. But in the unlikely event, an active shooter got in our building. What our security team wants you to hear is this. The best thing you can do is get down as close to the floor as possible. There are enough security guys in each room that if a shooter got in, they're going to be engaging the shooter, and you don't need to be in the way. So the first line for you is simply get down as close to the floor as you can and stay down. Don't pop your head up to see what's going on. Stay down on the floor, okay? They'll let you know um, when it's all clear, and I assure you, uh, their first line is to move to the shooter in order to protect you, all right? Um, the second thing with that is we know in a church our size, there are probably people with concealed carry permits um, that have weapons in our church on Sunday mornings. We have not ever chosen to post signs that say gun-free zone. We've never chosen to announce that. We almost feel like that would make us a target, but we know there are people who are carrying that, that we don't know about. Um, and I just want to say, if you're one of those, you need to hear very clearly, and this is from our security team, if you carry a concealed weapon and there's an active shooter situation, they would strongly advise you not to pull your weapon out, and here's why. If they don't know who you are, or if law enforcement coming in to respond doesn't know who you are, it's very likely that you would get shot, okay? Plus the fact, just because you have a concealed carry permit doesn't mean you're trained 
in an active shooter situation. You could end up hurting someone else. We're going to tell you like we do everyone else, even if you're carrying, what you need to do is get down and stay down and let the security team handle that situation. Okay? A couple of quick updates. Um, I met with Doug uh, Shelby on our staff who works with our security team on the Monday after uh, the white settlement shooting. We talked about things we might want to do differently. Uh, one thing we're going to begin doing differently on Sunday morning is changing our lockdown procedures. As you know, when you arrive, you can come in just about any door. There are greeters there. It's, it's a time where we have eyes on people and we're not really concerned about it. But when the service time is over, 1030, 1045, uh, and people are exiting, a lot of our security guys are going to classes, doing those kind of things. So we're going to change our procedure, and that is this. When, when worship is over on Sunday morning, uh, once the crowd has exited the building, the entire building will be locked down except for three entrances. The front main lobby, which always has security personnel in it. Uh, the north lobby, which is where a lot of you probably come in off the back parking lot. And then the west lobby, where all the big glass doors are at the end of the hallway. Those three areas will have security personnel. They'll be manning those entrances. So if you were to go out to your car, if you were to arrive late, whatever, you can get in those three places. Those three places are close enough to any parking lot that you should have no problem getting access to the building. That happens at 11 o'clock. At 11.30, the entire building is locked down. So if you should happen to uh, go out to your car because your class is having a fellowship after Sunday school, whatever, the only entrance you could get in is the main entrance because there's security personnel there uh, all through the day. Okay? Only other thing is this. Um, I don't think this would happen with any of you, but if you are, are not, if you're new enough that our security folks would not recognize you, if you walk in in a trench coat or carrying a big duffel bag, they may ask you uh, to open your coat or let them look in the duffel bag. And we talked about that. We're worried about uh, offending guests. I don't think any guest coming on our campus is offended about the fact we're trying to keep them secure. So those are a couple new procedures that are in place. Um, the update today was not to cause you any sense of anxiety, but to assure you uh, you're well cared for. We have a phenomenal security team. They constantly train. They constantly evaluate. In fact, today they're having their second meeting since the white settlement shooting, just continuing to evaluate and making sure that all of our procedures are where they need to be. So I want you to feel secure about that. You know what? We're here to worship the Lord. We trust the Lord. Uh, we don't foolishly trust the Lord. We do everything he shows us to do, and you can feel confident about that and, and come to worship and just be able to focus on him. Father, thank you that we can gather this morning for worship. God, thank you for these who've chosen to take the time to come and gather together with the family of faith, to worship you and to be encouraged and to be Challenge, Father, I pray that you'd help us in these moments to get our hearts and minds completely focused on you so that we can hear what your spirit has to say to us today. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amazing love.
this one bring suffering Lord I will remember what Calvary has bought for me both now and morning. Uh, this morning's prayer focus is on the sanctity of human life. And if you were in the lobby, you probably saw that we have a lot of our partners here this morning with us. And I hope between now and Sunday school, if you haven't done so, that you will go and just speak to our partners and find out what it is that we as a body are doing on this important issue in our culture. But a lot of times when we talk about the sanctity of human life, we, we focus on the unborn and rightfully so because there are millions of babies that are killed every single year, not just in our country, but around the world. And we as the body must stand and, and to the Father and call out to the Father on behalf of these innocents. But when we talk about the sanctity of human life, it's not only about the unborn, it's also about the living. It's about the orphans, it's about the foster children, it's about the abused and the neglected, and not only children, but adults as well. Uh, because throughout our culture and the sinfulness of our culture, so many people are taken advantage of. And one partner we have the blessing to have this morning is PATH, or Partners Against Trafficking Humans. And Sonia Vincent is here with us this morning. She is the Director of Community Education. Going to share a little bit about what PATH. PATH is a little bit of a newer partner with us, but very excited uh, to be working with them. So, Sonia, if you would, just share with us a little bit about what PATH does and the ministries that you do. I just got to say God is so good. That song just really, really touched my heart this morning. And it makes me think about all of the things that we're doing at PATH. And at PATH, we provide services to survivors of sexual abuse, sexual assault, as well as sex trafficking. Great. And, you know, a lot of times when we hear about human trafficking, we think, oh, that's in the big cities, right. that's in other parts of the world. Uh, how does that relate to us here in Little Rock? One of the things about Little Rock is that if you traveled here this morning, most of us came by interstate. The 3040 Exchange is one of the largest hubs for human trafficking. And at one time, Arkansas didn't have any laws. And so when criminals find out, well, they don't have any laws, that's where they tend to go. The thing about human trafficking is I grew up in an era where we considered, talked about stranger danger. No, you can't go to somebody's house and spend the night, Sonia. We don't know them. But now here, even in our state, we have people that are in relationship with us, our families, 
family members, friends, parents, teachers, lots of peer recruiting. And so it makes us easy targets because it's not just the people that you hear about the stories of the white vans that are riding around snatching people off the streets. It's people just like you and I, someone you may be sitting next to today that could be a victim or even a trafficker and you don't even realize that it's happening right here at home. So how can we as a church, if you don't know, part of the Barnabas Project, we didn't announce this because that was a secure location, a lot of security involved, as you can imagine, with this ministry. But as part of the Barnabas Project, we went and helped uh, improve a room in one of their facilities. But what are other ways that we as a body, but also as individuals, can partner with you in your ministry and help you? First, let me say thank you so, so much. You all don't know how much you blessed us with making that a room. Um, if you ever do get a chance to come out, that room was just an empty space like a garage, and now it's the kids' safe place. We have lots of children that come to us that need a safe place to go. Our youngest survivor right now is seven. She's been in our program for the last three years. And so, again, it breaks the myth that it's someone walking up and down the street that you know, they're out there because they want to be. No young child wants to be sold or wants to be a porn star or wants to be bought for sex. And so to be able to see those kids come in and see that room and how it's transformed and this is their safe place and to pick out, that's my locker. This is where I'm going to sit. So just for a big thank you for doing that. Um, we've seen a huge transition in those young people. But people can get involved. We have a 24-hour helpline where you can take calls from people that are on the streets that need a safe place to go. We have a, drive, a need for a drive team that goes out and does emergency transports. And that also may come in on a day-to-day -day basis to transport them to appointments, therapies, to bring them into the Life Center. At our Life Center, where you came in, where the project was provided, we teach them life skills, um, cooking, budgeting, finance, Bible study, healthy relationships, anything that can help them get on track to have a better life. Well, Sonia, we want to pray for you this morning. So I'm yes. going to ask Sonia to just kind of come down here to the front and take that microphone for me. I just want to oh, say one more thing. One okay, more I'm thing. Take that microphone from you. you say whatever you'd like. You know, this is a hard job. And every time we think we've heard the hardest story, we hear another one. And so it's also a hard job. So you have to have a heart to do what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, you can okay. All right, thanks. So Sonia's going to come down here to the front. You can go around the stairs if you'd like. If you guys would come and just gather around here, and just as we typically do, just really like to, to pray for Sonia and uh, pray for that ministry. As you've heard from her already, it's a very challenging one. They see things that we don't even know about on our daily basis. So just pray that God would just uh, draw uh, women and other people who have been impacted by this to that ministry and that uh, God would just give them a great opportunity to share his love with them. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you and Lord, we know what your word says, Lord, that you have given great value to every human life. And Lord, your word tells you that we were knit together by you in our mother's womb. And there's nothing that happens to us that is hidden from you. And Lord, so we just say that on behalf of every human being right now is experiencing abuse, trafficking, Lord, who is being taken advantage of by the sinfulness of man, Lord, that you would just bring comfort and peace. Lord, I thank you so much for partnerships such as with PATH, and Lord, for those that you called to this very diff difficult ministry, I thank you for their hearts and pressing it upon them. Lord, continue to give them perseverance in the midst of that and as give them the words of peace and of love to speak to them in the middle of their brokenness. Lord, we know that you are the great healer of broken hearts. And we know, Lord, that nothing that has happened is beyond your forgiveness and beyond what you can do in repairing lives. Because, Lord, that is why you are a great God and we serve you and we praise you because you take what is broken and you make it beautiful for your sake and for your glory. So, Lord, we just thank you for this partnership and pray your blessings and your mercy upon PATH and all who work there. And may you be glorified as lives are restored and your name is glorified. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who makes all this possible.
love you so much, and we believe that you truly satisfy us through your son, Jesus. God, we have searched for so long, many of us longer in our lives for something that gives us purpose and something that satisfies us. And God, we are coming to you declaring that you, you're the only one that can do that. God, we know that we will never thirst again if we drink from your living water. And so we worship you and we thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray and we sing together. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Let me invite your attention this morning to the fourth chapter of the book of Matthew. While you're turning there, I want to mention, I know you've heard it a couple of times already this morning, I want to mention that next Sunday is the uh, 42nd annual March for Life. Um, 47 years ago, on January 22nd of 1973, was a Supreme Court decision, Roe v. Wade, that authorized the killing of unborn children at any stage while well, they were growing in the safety of the womb. And if you've been around Gary Springs very long, you know we take a very strong stands, uh, stand on life. And one of the reasons we show up next Sunday to march, you know, you could look at it and say, well, it's been uh, 47 years and, and nothing has changed. Well, we know personally as a church body that while maybe nothing has changed in regard to the law of the land, we have seen, in fact, a few weeks ago, you met a child that was saved because of our faithfulness to pray and to stand for life. And we know that happens over and over and over again. So I want to encourage you next Sunday to consider uh, joining me, uh, lots of Geyer Springs folks, and then thousands of people from around the state. All the details are there uh, in your bulletin. Let me also mention that w when we say we're a pro-life church, one of the arguments sometimes that's thrown uh, at, at pro-life folks and organizations is, well, all you care about is the baby. No, we care about anyone uh, whose life is threatened or in danger. We, we're about the whole process. In fact, I don't know if you noticed when you came in this morning, but I hope as you leave uh, both here and upstairs in the venue that you'll stop by the main lobby. The main lobby is filled with partner organizations that we work with, and it's not just crisis pregnancy centers. It's our children's home. It's uh, Second Chance Ranch. It's uh, human trafficking. It's, it's uh, organizations that help with foster and adoption. It's even one organization that helps women who've had an abortion that are dealing with uh, the post-traumatic uh, stress from that, an organization to help them. So we believe in helping in any way we can on any front in the issue of life. Uh, next week, next Sunday, if, if you've never gotten involved before, it's just a simple way. It takes about 45 minutes uh, at the state capitol, just a simple way to stand and say that we uh, defend life. Um, second thing this morning, we're, we're journeying through the New Testament together. We're encouraging all of the body um, to read through the New Testament this year. It's just five chapters a week, uh, just a chapter a day is going to get us through the entire New Testament. Now, if you're like me, um, this last week we were Matthew 1 through 5. I got to go back through Matthew 5. There's a lot, lot there. But there are journals available. Most of you, I think about a thousand ordered these in advance, but if you did not do that, you weren't here, you're just hearing this for the first time, we do still have journals available uh, today in the main lobby. Um, you can stop by and get those. It's got a place to write your daily uh, notes from your study. It's got a place for, oh, sermon notes. Huh, what a novel idea. You never know when the pastor might say something worth jotting down, or you might see some scriptural insight. It's a place for that. Scripture memory, I know you already went through the Scripture memory verse uh, for this month. We're going to memorize 12 verses together this year. And then, of course, a place to, uh, to jot down um, your, your prayer requests and the things that you see uh, God answer. But it's not too late for you to jump in and, and join us in that. All right, the message this morning, uh, we, we will be preaching from uh, what you have read through the week. The message this morning is in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 1 through 11. Let's look at that together. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. 
For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Well, we're at the beginning or, or the launch point, if you will, from, from Matthew's um, description or journal of Jesus' ministry. If you look back in Matthew chapter 3, he describes the baptism and the anointing of Jesus. Jesus was baptized when he came up out of the water. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, anointed him, landed on him. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So that was the, the declaration of who Jesus is, that he's the son of God. And the temptation here in Matthew 4 is the demonstration of who he is. He is the perfect, uh, sinless son of God, uh, he has power over Satan, he has power over evil, and he was perfect and sinless. And as we look at the temptation of Jesus, we, we've got to ask, uh, what is it that God, what, what help, what understanding does God have here for us? He didn't put that in there just to record it. Obviously, in, in putting that in and having Matthew record that, there's some things that we can learn from the temptation of Jesus. Now, let me mention this at the outset. It's important that we understand that God can't be tempted to do evil, nor does he tempt us to do evil. You see that in James chapter 1 and verse 13. James explains that when you're tempted, uh, you can't blame God. You can't say that's from God. You can't say God's trying to, to trip me up because God has no evil in him. He couldn't possibly tempt us to do evil, and he doesn't do evil. In James 1, 1 through 12, he does mention that God does allow trials to come into our life for our benefit. Why? Because trials prove our faith. If our faith is never tested, it will never be strengthened. If our faith is, if faith is never tested, we will never know if it's a true and genuine faith. So God will allow trials to come to test our faith and to make us stronger and to build our character. So trials are allowed by God or brought on by God, but temptation is not from God. The purpose of temptation is to make us fail, to, to entice us or to, to lead us into sin. God can't tempt us to sin and God cannot do evil. So... We have a problem right out of the gate here in verse 1. Look at it again. It says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit. What Spirit? The Spirit of God. Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. There's kind of a holy tension here, and, and I don't really know how to help you with it, but just to say that while God doesn't tempt, clearly he's saying here, the Spirit led Jesus to the place where he would be tempted. Why would God do that? You know, sometimes those trials or the testing or the proving of our faith is going to include temptation. God doesn't tempt us, but God may allow us to be tempted in order to strengthen us, even in order to bring glory to God, depending on how we respond to that temptation. So there, there are two errors that we have to be careful about when we, when, we, when we talk about temptation. Two errors we have to avoid. I've already mentioned the first. Temptation never comes from God. We, we can't blame him when we're tempted. But secondly, we need to understand that, that there's no reason to be coward or no reason to be mentally overwhelmed by Satan's power. Satan is only allowed to do what God allows him to do. He doesn't act independently. You're probably familiar with the story of, of Job in the Old Testament and how Satan came and asked God for permission to test Job. God is not going to allow you to be tempted to the point where you're going to fail. He's not out to cause you to fail. He's not out to trip you up. But God may allow Satan to tempt you. 1 Corinthians 1.13 says that, that God limits what Satan can do. We're all tempted but God does not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able. He knows what we're made of. He doesn't allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but even with the temptation provides a way of escape. And so please don't get overwhelmed in thinking, wow, Satan just can wail on me all the time, all this temptation. No, while God does not tempt, he will put you through trials and through tests. Some of that may include temptation from Satan, but he cannot do anything that God does not allow. 
All right, now, as we look here in Matthew 4 at the temptation of Jesus, let's remember that although Jesus was God, always has been God, he's co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal, in, in this case, we know that Jesus was operating not out of his deity, but out of his humanity. Remember that Jesus, when, when he came to earth, that Jesus came in, in, in bodily form. He became a human. Paul in Philippians 2 describes that. He says, even though he was God, he didn't regard that something to be grasped or held on to, but he emptied himself and was made in the likeness of a man. Now, why is that important? Because it'd be tempting to say, well, yes, Jesus overcame temptation because Jesus was God. Yes, he was God, but in this case, what we're reading here in Matthew, what you read through the Gospels about the life of Jesus was that he was in a human bodily form. He was humanity. He had to deal with the very same things that we deal with. So God, the Spirit, leads him to a place where he's going to be tempted or he's going to be tested right here at the outset of his ministry. Why? First of all, to prove his faithfulness. To prove his faithfulness. Think about the fact that Jesus, in his humanity, there had to be some times he questioned, can I really do this? And we see it at the end of his life in ministry, right? In the garden he's praying, he's, Father, is there any other way? Is there some other way that you can bring about your redemptive plan of saving mankind? But he had the resolve, because he'd been tested, he had the resolve to say, nevertheless, not my will but yours. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7, in the prophecy about the crucifixion of of Jesus, it said that he set his face like a flint. As he looked to the cross, he set his face like the flint. He was hard. He was fast. He knew exactly what was going to happen and what he had to do. And even in his humanity, he was able to have the strength and the resolve he needed to carry out God's plan of redemption. Well, what about us? What, what does this temptation of Jesus say to us? Well, first of all, we learn some things uh, about Jesus that help us in our own temptation. The first thing you see in Matthew 4 is that Jesus, in his humanity, was able to overcome temptation. What does that say to us? It says that we, in Christ, also have that same ability. He's operating in his humanity. He's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He's hungry. If he was in his deity, he wouldn't have been hungry. He was in humanity. He's hungry, and that's the point that Satan starts with in trying to trip him up. I would also point you to verse 11 to emphasize his humanity. In verse 11, it says that after this time of tempting, the angels came and ministered to him. Who are angels? Well, they're lesser beings than Jesus. They're created beings. Why would Jesus, if he was strictly deity, why would Jesus need the ministry of these lesser beings if he was operating out of the strength of his deity? He was operating out of his humanity. And he was weak, and he was tired, and he was hungry, and and that's why they came and ministered to him. So what we see in the temptation of Jesus was, even in his humanity, he was able to overcome temptation. The second thing I want you to see is that Jesus, because he has been through what we've been through, Hebrews says he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Because he's been through what we've been through, he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses, He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. He was subjected to the same weaknesses and the same temptations. Listen, when you're going through a difficult time, whether it's a temptation or a trial or or something in your life that's unpleasant, when you're going through a difficult time and, and you're praying and you sense the Spirit saying and you sense Jesus saying to you, I know how you feel, don't dismiss that. He knows how you feel. He can sympathize with everything that you and I go through because he lived in a human body and its limitations. The other thing right along with that that you need to see from this temptation is that when Scripture says that Jesus is a merciful and and faithful high priest, you need to understand that when you come to Jesus with your sins, he is so ready and so willing to forgive your sin. The role of the high priest in, in the Old Testament was when the people came and made sacrifice for their sin, he was the mediator between them and God. Not a perfect mediator because he was a man, but he was the mediator between them and God so that God would atone for their sin. Jesus in his mercy is able to atone to pay for our sin and also offer us forgiveness. 
And he, as a merciful and faithful high priest, can give us victory over our sin. Well, look at the temptation. In verses 2 and 3, we're told that Jesus has been fasting. Why was he fasting? Well, that was a very regular, especially in, in the Jewish culture, that was a very regular thing that they did to increase their spiritual sensitivity or increase their spiritual receptivity for the, toward the Lord. It's a good practice today as well. You don't hear much about it. Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And so what does Satan do? He begins the attack at Jesus' point of physical need. Now, I want you to notice, and you might even want to circle this in your Bible, I want you to notice the very first word Satan utters as he tempts Jesus. This is a major key in, in understanding how we become weak and vulnerable to temptation. First word. You see it? It's a little bitty word. It's just two letters. And, but this single monosyllable, this little two-letter word, is a powerhouse in Satan's plan to, to entice us to turn away from the loving Father. What's the word? If. If. If you are the Son of God. Now, does Satan know who Jesus is? Absolutely. He knows who he is. That's why he has shown up here to tempt him. He doesn't need proof. He's not saying, if you're the Son of God, prove it to me this way. He's not saying that. He doesn't need proof of who Jesus is. James 2.19, talking to those who claim the name of Christ but don't really believe. If you believe that God is one, if you believe there's one God, great for you. The demons even believe that, and they shudder. Satan knew exactly who Jesus was. So when he says, if you are the Son of God, he's not saying, prove to me you're Son of God. He's trying to implant a doubt in Jesus' mind that the Father really cares about the Son. If you're God's son, if you're God's son, why have you been left alone in this deserted, dreary place in this wilderness? If you're God's son, why are you hungry? If you're God's son, how come all this time you've spent fasting to be more sensitive to the Father? How come in all this time he hasn't even met your need for food? If you're God's son, why are you in the condition you're in? And do you see it's the same lie and the same trick that he used in the garden? He tried to cast doubt in, in the minds of Adam and Eve about the goodness of God. Eve, did God say you can't eat from any of the trees in the garden? No, he said I can't eat from that tree. Well, listen, Eve, here's the deal. God is withholding from you. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't want the best for you. The reason God won't let you eat from that tree is God knows the minute you eat from that tree, you'll be like him. And isn't that what we all want, to be our own God? It's the same trick and the same lie that he used in the garden. And what I want you to hear is this. Satan can easily tempt you to sin and entice you to turn away from God if he can cause you to doubt the goodness of God. If. If you're God's child, if God really is a gracious, loving, caring father, why do you struggle financially? How come you don't have more money? How come you don't have a better job? How come you don't have a nicer house? How come you don't have a, a more dependable car? If you're God's child and if God really cares about you, why do you suffer physically? Why do you have a disability or an impairment or a chronic disease? If you're God's child and if God really cares about you, why do you struggle relationally? Why are you alone? Why are you still single? Why are you divorced? Why are you widowed? Why, why is it you don't even have a single person you can call a, a really close friend and confidant? If you're God's child, if God really cares about you, why do you feel so insignificant? Why don't you have a higher place on the food chain, a greater position, more power, a higher status? If, 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 if Satan is going to ask you if and he's going to cast out on the goodness of God and he's going to make you wonder if you're even a child of God and if you are a child of God, does God really care? So what does he do? He plants that doubt, and then he encourages us to take matters in our own hands, to meet our own needs, and to do that by whatever means is necessary. Listen, is there anything wrong with Jesus having some bread? No, he's hungry. But what Satan's saying is, if God won't meet your needs, you do it. Jesus, just perform a miracle and, and take care of yourself. You know what you're going to see, and, and you've probably noticed this before, but it, you'll be reminded as we read through the New Testament, and specifically over the next couple of months, the, the Gospels, where you're going to see about the life of Jesus is that he was completely submitted to the Father's will. 
Jesus himself said, I do what I see the Father doing. He only works miracles. He doesn't perform miracles for himself to satisfy his needs. He doesn't perform miracles so that people will notice him and pay attention to him. He only works miracles at the Father's initiative, and he's not going to take control from the Father's hands. What was Jesus' response? He said, look, we don't live, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, Satan, listen, my life is not sustained by physical food, but by obeying God and following his purpose and will as it's stated in his word. Simply put, Jesus said, my father is not provided for this need. I'm not going to exercise my will over his. I'll wait for him to supply. I'll wait for him to provide. I'm not going to subvert his will. Here's the thing. If God wills you to live, you don't have to have bread. You can live without bread. If it's God's will for you to die, all the bread in the world is not going to keep you alive. Jesus is saying, look, it's a spiritual matter, not a physical matter. Our focus is to be on the Word of God. Our needs are met according to His plan and purpose, which is revealed in His Word. And what happens is when we decide we don't like his provision, we decide we're going to take matters in our own hands, and we fail, and we fall to temptation, and we're going to sin, and we're going to follow the plan of Satan. Verse 5 through 8, the second temptation. There's the if again, the, the seed of doubt. Hey, Jesus, if you're really God's son, if you're really God... Make him work a miracle for you. Make him do it your way. Now, this is building on that first temptation. Look, God didn't give, if God's not going to give you what you want, force his hand. I mean, you're his child. If you're his child, then, then he has to come through, doesn't he? And, and we're tempted to make God our genie. We go somewhere we know we shouldn't go. We do something that, that we, we know is sin, and then we expect God to, to bail us out. Let me interject here that when a, when a child of God sins and comes to him in confession and true repentance, that child of God is forgiven. God has promised when we bring our sin to him that he forgives us, Isaiah one eighteen. he forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, Psalm 103.12, he separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. When we come to God in true repentance, we confess and we truly repent, we change our ways, we turn around, God forgives, but that doesn't mean there won't still be some consequences to our sin. That doesn't mean there won't be some circumstances that we have to live with. We said, God, if you really cared for me, you would fix this, or you would do this, or you would give me that. And and we've got to understand, we can't force God to act or to use his power, especially if it's out of his will. Now, if Jesus had done the swan dive off the pinnacle of the temple, can you imagine, look at how Jesus struggled with people understanding him, with people believing he was the son of God. If he took the swan dive off the, uh, the temple of the pinnacle, and just as the psalmist promised he was held in the hand of God lest his foot even strike a stone, he would have had instant notoriety. All attention would have been on him. But here's the thing, he wasn't looking for immediate acceptance and and notoriety. Jesus didn't come to be accepted by the masses. Jesus came to be rejected. And Jesus came to die. Satan's going to tempt you when you're not getting what you want. He's going to tempt you to demand that God prove that he loves you. When God doesn't do what you want and doesn't meet your expectations, he's going to lead you to question God's reliability. And that's what this is. It's a test of God. We're not to test God. We're not to test God. We're tempted to do that when we lack faith. We're not sure that God really is who he claims to be and that he really cares. Finally, in verses 8 through 11, the third temptation, the most brazen offer of all, Jesus sa- or Satan says to Jesus, look, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world in return for your worship. Listen, Jesus has already been promised that by the Father. All the glory, all the kingdoms of the world are going to be his after he goes through his death and resurrection. So why is Satan making this offer? Well, he's trying to seduce him to not 
take the hard road, but the easy road. He's trying to offer him instant power and authority and wealth apart from the way of the cross. What's he doing? He, he's basically saying, look, Jesus, it's just a little compromise. You don't have to go through all that hardship. You don't have to go through all the difficulties you're going to go through and the painful death on the cross. God requires that, but, but why don't you take the easy way? And it's the same way that Satan tempts us. He says, look, look at all the world has to offer. Look at all the success and all the wealth and, and, and health and the good life that could be yours. Look at all the world has to offer. Listen, going God's way is too hard. It demands too much. For goodness sakes, God tells you you have to take up your cross and you have to suffer. So they said, listen, I'm telling you that if you serve me, you can have all the best of the world has to offer. But the question you ought to ask is, how long is that going to last? Satan can give you all those things. But if you serve Satan, you can't go his way and God's way. You, you can't do both. And there are a lot of professing Christians who try to serve God and Satan, and, and they think they can kind of ride the fence. I had an old deacon tell me one time, son, you need to be careful about riding the fence. Because the thing about riding the fence is you're either going to fall off or you're going to split your britches. <laughs> you can't serve two masters. You serve God or you serve Satan. And we would do well to remember when Satan offers us all the pleasures of this life, we do well to think about the payment plan on that. To get all the pleasures and all the things this world has to offer, we serve Satan. And the payment plan very simply is, well, you may have all the wealth of this world as long as you live. When you die, you're going to be incredibly destitute, impoverished in the next life of eternal judgment. Whatever joy you might have had in this life is going to vanish at the moment of death. Hebrews 11, in that great hall of faith, Moses is mentioned, and it says about Moses, you remember that Moses was in Pharaoh's household. He had everything that, that he could possibly want and even more, but it says that Moses, rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin, chose to be mistreated with the Israelites. Why? Because he knew the pleasures of sin last only for a season. Satan's going to offer you a lot, but the price is pretty high. Well, let me, let me see, looking at these three temptations of Jesus, let me see if I can bring us to some very clear and succinct application points. And these are great things to write down in that journal space um, in, your, in your booklet. Number one, you have to decide whom you'll believe. Will you believe Satan and the promises of the world, or will you believe God? See, your, your success... And my success in overcoming temptation all boils down to that little two-letter word, if. If God is a gracious and loving Father, if God's plan and purpose is best. I ran across this definition of temptation this week that I think helps really bring clarity that here's temptation is an enticement or an invitation to sin, listen, with the implied promise of a greater good to be derived from following the way of disobedience. The implied promise. You know, Satan is the greatest uh, master at defrauding. The implied promise is a greater good, but he's not going to deliver on it. He can't deliver on it. He can't give you a greater good when your eternity following Satan is an eternity in hell apart from God. So do you believe the way of the world, the way of Satan, or do you believe that God provides the greater good? You have to decide whom you believe. Secondly, you have to consistently focus on the truth. Jesus' answer every time was rooted in Scripture. You can't live by bread alone. You can't test the Lord your God. You can't serve two masters. You have to serve one or you have to serve the other. Where you put your focus determines your direction, determines your outcome. How many of you have ever heard of the moth effect? You ever heard of the moth effect? Most law enforcement guys would know about the moth effect. And the moth effect, without going into a lot of detail, and you can, you can Google this and, and look it up. It's not typically called that. It's called target fixation. 
But the moth effect, just like a moth, if, if you're in a very dark place and you light a flame or, or you uh, put a light bulb out, a moth is drawn to that. It focuses on that and it's drawn to it. The moth effect is that when you're driving down, let's say, the interstate, you're driving down I-30, perhaps at night, because it's more difficult at night, and you see uh, lights, you see flashing lights on the side of the road, on the shoulder, you focus on that so much that before you realize it, you're steering straight in that direction. You've heard stories of people being injured or even killed, law enforcement officers being killed because someone going down the interstate swerved and hit them. That's the moth effect. It's what, what, what they were focused on, and that's what caused them to be drawn that way. What are we focused on? We've got to focus on, on the truth. Psalm 119, how can a young man keep his way pure? By obeying your word, your word I've hid in my heart that I may not sin against God. When temptation comes, we have to have already built the Word of God into our hearts and lives so that that has our focus, so that we're saturating our, our mind and our heart with the Word of God. You have to decide whom you believe. You have to focus on the truth. And then speaking of focus, you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, as, as we run the race with endurance, what does he say to do? Cast off every sin and everything that entangles us and focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Why do we focus on Jesus? Because we look at the temptation he faced in his humanity and recognize he didn't sin. And if he didn't sin and we're in him and, and he died to free us from the power of sin, then we can overcome temptation. It just depends on what we're focused on. When I was in Fort Worth 30-some years ago, I had a, a friend, uh, a guy that I worked with who had a buddy that um, was involved in the business of training guard dogs for protecting property, for protecting people, and, and he was telling Rick the process they went through in training these dogs, and he said, really, the most interesting thing that you would like to see is the final test. He said, after we spent several weeks and sometimes months training these dogs, the final test is we'll take them in a room and we'll put their trainer in front of them and the trainer will give the command to sit and stay. He said, once the command is given, someone comes in from a side door with a steak. Big juicy one, hot off the grill where you, the smell just fills the room. And that platter with the steak, they'll slide directly in front of the dog and see what the dog does. And this trainer told Rick, he said, I can tell in an instant if the dog is going to pass or fail because when that steak comes in and it's slid across the floor right under his nose, if he just for a split second takes a glance, he's done. He's going for it. The dogs that pass the test are the dogs who never take their eye off their master. It doesn't matter what's happening down here. It doesn't matter what they smell. It doesn't matter what they like to do. They never take their eyes off their master. You focus on Jesus. And then finally, along with that, you see temptation as an opportunity to express your love for God. Now think about that. You focus your eyes on Jesus. You think about what he's done. And when you consider what Jesus did to love you, you're, you're the object of his love. He wants to be the object of your love. You know that every temptation that comes your way is an opportunity to tell God how much you love him. you got to know the truth. It's got to be saturated in your life where the Spirit can use it and speak it to you when you're tempted. You've got to keep your focus on him. If you believe that his ways are better than the world's ways and you keep your focus on him and you train your thoughts and your attention on him, then you have opportunity to say no to temptation and yes to God. Let me point out one final thing here at the end of the chapter. In verse 11, it says that after the temptation, the devil left him and the angels came and ministered to him. Jesus had been in the wilderness. He was tired. He, he was hungry. Again, he was in human form. In his humanity, he had to withstand this barrage of temptation. And so when it was all done, the, the angels, these spiritual beings, came and ministered to him. You know that it says in Hebrews 1.14 that angels are, are um, ministering spirits that are sent to those who have inherited salvation. What does that mean? Angels are there for me and you as well. You know, when we withstand, when we stand up to temptation, when we get through that time, the Spirit of God helps us 
The Spirit of God works in us, and I believe, based on Jesus' experience in his human form, that the very angels of God also minister to us and get us through. Listen, we all face temptation. Many different kinds, from many different arenas. Jesus, when we say Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, doesn't mean he had every single temptation we've had, but every type of temptation we'll experience, he experienced, and he gained victory over in his humanity, in his humanness, he gained victory. If he did, we can. You just have to be prepared. We have to understand the truths of God's word and we have to put them to work in our lives. And as we stand for him, he blesses us. We glorify him. We advance the gospel message because we live faithfully for him. This morning as we uh, respond to uh, the word, uh, to what we've heard this morning, uh, we're just going to take time to pray. Um, you know, for some of us, uh, the process of reorienting our focus and um, telling God that we trust him and we love him, it's going to take more than just a couple minutes this morning. Um, we're all facing different things. For some of us, we're right there. And so this morning was uh, just what we needed to get over that threshold. But there's some of us that are just, we're in it. Um, and so we just need to make those conscious decisions to reorient our focus and to focus on God's goodness and, and to tell him we love him and we trust him. And sometimes uh, it takes telling him that uh, over and over again before we begin to look for it and see his goodness uh, and to trust him. And so we're gonna do that this morning. I'm gonna pray for us and then give you some time to respond. Whatever you're facing, um, whatever it is that is causing you to uh, be tempted to take things into your own hands or to not trust God and not trust his goodness and to look elsewhere. And um, I've been there. Um, I've been in those moments where I've just said, God, I, I don't, I, I want to take things into my own hands or God, I don't see you, but, but I know that you're working. Um, and so I've had to tell him that. And it doesn't change the circumstance, but it changes my focus, changes me. And so I'm going to pray for us and give you just some time to respond. If you need to pray with a pastor, that we pastors on either side of the room. If you need to just talk to someone and say, I'm dealing with this, and so I need prayer. Um, we're happy to do that. We would love to do that. So let me pray for us and let's respond. God, we love you. And God, even just declaring that is taking a step away from that temptation uh, towards you towards your goodness, towards the things you have for us. God, I pray that, that us in this room, that as we make those declarations this morning, even if they're difficult to make, that God, we would begin to choose you over those things. And God, that you would minister to, to us. God, that you would give us confidence and trust in you, a glimmer of hope, as we declare those things, that you are better than what we're facing, than the things we desire. God, you're better than our comfort. You're better than our temporary pleasure. God, you're better than us feeling like we have things figured out. Because God, you have it figured out. And so God, I pray for us in this room that you would show us where we're not trusting you. God, where we're allowing the enemy to tempt us. God, that as we take those steps, that you would move and that we would see you at work and we would continue to trust you and continue to tell you that we love you. So God, as we respond, would you be glorified? Would you be honored? And would you minister to our souls? We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond together.
Oh, there we go. Um, our prayer for you this week is that no matter what you're facing, um, whatever temptations or trials you're facing, that um, that you would use it as an opportunity to declare to God that you love him and you trust him and that he would guide you um, through those circumstances, beyond those temptations, and that you'd be able to speak of his goodness um, to your fellow believers, but also to those who don't know Jesus. Um, as you leave today, our connection team will be at the doors to collect any offerings or any connection tabs. Remember, if you're new to Geyer Springs and want to um, find out more, I'm standing right over there after service. Uh, we hope that you have an incredible morning. You're dismissed. Thanks so much for joining us online. I trust the message was meaningful to you and that you received some help on how to handle temptation in your life. If you'd like to speak with a pastor or pray with someone, you can contact us at the information on your screen. Let me also ask you to consider joining us again next week, either online or live here on our campus. Our modern service meets at 930 in the venue. Hope to see you then.